Let's turn to Mark chapter one and talk about authority, the authority of Jesus and the nature of that authority. Here we go. A person who might think about how authority is received. So glance first through, through the chapter. This is the beginning of the good news, the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then we see the nature of that messiahship, that son of godness in action. And Jesus is baptized, calls his disciples, and then he enters the synagogue and begins teaching. And so this is where we're going to pick up, pick up the story. OK, the enter Capernaum on the Sabbath. Jesus enters the synagogue and begins teaching. The people who heard him were astonished. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes there. Exousia. It's very close to Mark chapter 6, where he again goes into the synagogue and again preaches, and the people are again astonished. So we have to deduce that this is a typical way of describing Jesus' teaching and its effects on the hearers. You see it in Luke 4 as well. But Mark 6 highlights Jesus' wisdom and his deeds of power. But in this chapter, in chapter 1 in Mark, the emphasis is on exousia, on the authority of Jesus. So if we're thinking about the nature of that authority, the first thing to say is that it is a unique kind of authority. It has an effect on the hearers because of its specialness, because of its unique style and brand. And the word exousia is related to the verb exeste, which means it's free or it's, it's allowable, it's permissible. And that carries the idea of somebody who acts without any hindrance. Jesus is teaching in a sovereignly free way, contrasted with the teaching of the scribes. And the difference is that the scribes teaching authority depends upon their knowledge of an adherence to a tradition and specifically to a traditional interpretation of the Torah. But Jesus is is without any university background, without any any teaching experience as far as they're concerned. And he's just coming into it in a completely free way, in a authoritative way. I remember one time traveling when I was a very small child on the motorway and we went into a service station, which was kind of new for our family. And we we went into the service station and my brother and I went into the slot machine place where you're not allowed to go. When you, so we were looking in at all the guys putting money in the slot machines. And my father came to find us, who's very cross. And he stood at the door and he said, everybody off the machines and he meant me and my brother but everybody <laughs> in the area stopped looked guilty and stepped away from the machine because my father spoke with this sovereign free assumption that he had a right to speak Do you get the picture and this is how jesus spoke and everybody stepped back from their machine to take a look so to speak. OK, so the scribes only assumption of authority was by by saying, well, as Rabbi Akiba said, as Rabbi Gamaliel said, that they're, they're batting ideas that they take from someone else. But Jesus taught on his own authority or on the authority of God. And whereby they were bound by tradition, he was free in the way that only one who lives directly from and to God's authority is free. It's like having a book without footnotes. You know how footnotes relate to what so-and-so said and so-and-so said and saying, and I say, maybe not that, maybe not that. But you're relating it to somebody else all the time. Jesus didn't. He just says, God said and he explains authority. Mark 1 explains authority via a comparison. He, 
Mark doesn't give us the content of Jesus's tradition, but we can find examples of the contrast of the difference between his teaching and the teaching of the Pharisee, uh, the scribes and Pharisees elsewhere in the gospel tradition. You might glance across at Mark chapter 12. Jesus says, why do the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David when scripture indicates that David called Messiah Lord? So do you see what's happening here? He is pointing out that the traditional interpretation is inadequate, that it doesn't go back to the real root. He's suggesting that who or what the Messiah is may break the traditional interpretation. He's inviting them to have a new thought. And again, in the Sermon on the Mount, again and again, he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, the traditional interpretation of the commandments is inadequate. And what God demands goes beyond what the scribes require. And then we come into the first exorcism passage in Mark's gospel. And this, again, is related as a focus on Jesus's authority. Typical exorcism story. He's described as having an unclean spirit. He's in the middle of the church service. And he says to Jesus, what have you to do with us? Jesus, Jesus rebuked the spirit and command to come out. And the account of the spirit's convulsions, the loud cry and exit from the man. And each of those characteristics can be found right the way through Mark's gospel as characteristic of exorcism it's like the authority to evict like a bailiff's notice this is going to happen it's going to happen now really interestingly the significant parallels between the story in mark one of what happened to the man and the story in mark four of what happened to the storm do you remember he said he rebuked the spirit. He commanded the wind and the waves to be silent, uh, to be still in chapter four, verse 39. And the response is parallel as well. In, in chapter one, he says, what is this? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And in chapter four, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So the reason for drawing that comparison is to suggest that for the early Christians who formulated and transmitted these stories, it's the same kind of thing. The exorcism and the stilling of the psalm illustrate a similar point. Jesus has power both over the natural world, the winds and the sea, and the supernatural world, demons. So it's a pixel power and authority are being meshed together at, the, at this point, and one expresses the other. So authority is this, as I said a moment ago, teaching without footnotes, claiming a right upon oneself, that you have the right to speak and to act and things to happen. And curiously, that in Chapter one, it's related to the exorcism. Think of this. The exorcism is, is called a new teaching. It's like a, a confirmation of his teaching authority. The scribes are teaching the same old stuff. We know this stuff and it's just so same old, same old. Yes, yes. And it's, it's kind of intellectual. It's a... Uh, it's good. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't actually do anything. And then all of a sudden, this new word is actually accomplishing something. This man is standing before us here. He is besieged by an unclean spirit and a word teaching has changed things. And his authority to teach is attested by this deed of power, power. OK, so it's exousia, authority, dunamis, power. In fact, the theme, the issue of Jesus's authority is, is a major theme right through to chapter three. In, in chapter two, 
Jesus says the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So we have this picture of what authority does. Well, it evicts the spirit from this this tormented man. And now it announces freedom from sin. And this is, as they noted straight away, an open declaration of divine authority. Only God can forgive sin. And the whole section is portraying Jesus as one who brings something so new that it threatens to break the old mold. You know, the new wineskins, this, this, this cannot be contained in the old way. And Mark mentions this and puts it right at the center of the section to highlight the whole section, to, to make it the central theme of the whole section, because the authority of Jesus is what brings him into conflict with the worldly authorities who represent the old authority. Powers and principalities, they're gathering, and it happens right at the beginning of Mark's gospel. And it's Jesus's claim to act on divine authority that leads to his arrest and death. Why? Why is that? It's because as soon as he announces something that is uncontainable, there's this tremendous desires come up to contain, to attempt to contain. As soon as he announces freedom from the restrictions of the past, from tradition, then there's this tendency to smother it, to hold it down to put it back into its place it's dangerous it's new and it's dangerous and the eventual result will be his death just as putting new wine into old wineskins causes the old wineskins to break and the new wine to be lost so jesus bringing the radical newness of his kingdom will lead to the breaking of the old and the spilling of his wine for the sake of many and the world resists God's reign and the world's sinful resistance will lead to the death of God's son and yet despite or rather through that death God will fulfill his purposes but this is in the future so how do we understand the authority of Jesus because it is still subversive it is still new and dangerous in a worldly sense Jesus did not have any power at all he was not a worldly king with political or military power remember him saying my followers would take up swords you know if, if i was that sort of a king he wasn't of the priests priestly clans who had the power in roman judea he wasn't even a scribe the only authority he had was this incredible confidence but what he did and said was God's will and God's word, God's truth. And his authority lay in the power of his words and then in the example of his deeds. He speaks, he speaks and listening to his word, new life, the dead receive. His power in the words and his authority lay in his living as God's servant. And Jesus, has, Jesus used that authority not to obtain power for himself, but to serve. I come among you as one to serve, not to be served, to give my life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10. And that contrast is still radical between the worldly understanding of success and power, and ego control. Even the, the lowly scribes <laughs> were onto a good number. They were respected. They were higher up. It was like peasants looking up to the middle class who knew the stuff. And they didn't. And Jesus subverts even that low level of authority. And his acting in authority brought blessing, brought health, brought healing. And his authority was a, an irresistible power that drew people not through manipulation, but simply through the person he was, through the truth of his own existence, through the gifts that he gave. And it wasn't necessarily open to empirical verification it was to the people of his time it must have appeared that he was 
anything but acting on God's authority to his opponents. Jesus was a blasphemer. And that's how they understood him. And that's how the trajectory of the gospel story is formed through this one point. And how different from the conception of authority and power in our politics that we are often witnesses to how politicians try to manipulate to say one thing and do another to use authority for self-aggrandizement to look for short-term gain even if that means doing the wrong thing rather than doing the right thing and trusting that good will out will the future be any different but jesus's authority invites us to imagine a new world and to live towards it May God bless you in the study of his word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.